Hi guys and welcome to JDM Masters Car Reviews and today we have a Nissan Skyline R33 GTR, a code name BCNR33 and we're here today, Ashinoko Skyline. It's a beautiful day as you can see and I have Mount Fuji in the background. Uh, this is really rare for us because every time we come up here it seems to be raining. Uh, even though this is a four-wheel drive car, um, I think because it's actually a part-time four-wheel drive, it's broken the curse of the rain. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the R33 Skyline GTR, codenamed the BCNR33, uh, in Nissan nomenclature. The first few letters always denotes the engine type and the body type. The last version was just simply BNR32, and 34 was also BNR32. It's a little strange that there was one letter added for the 33, but that was because they had more ranges in the Skyline range, uh, four-wheel drive, and also uh, two-door and four-doors, and so it was a little longer. Uh, so it's correctly called the BC and R33. So the R33 GTR is often a car that's misunderstood within the Skyline GTR range. In the West, uh, there's often memes like it's a boat, uh, even in among Japanese fans, uh, it was kind of the least favorite among the three GTRs because coming from the smaller and more compact, lighter 32, uh, it was seen as something that was like, was too big and too long and too heavy. But in actual fact, the R34 is actually heavier, although it was shorter than the R33. So we're going to talk a little bit about the history and the technical developments coming from the 32. So the example we have here is the first version 1995 non-V-Spec. It's owned by Tanner Will. You can check his Instagram over here. And he's managed to find a very clean example with very low mileage. Um, it's not even 60,000 kilometers. And in this day and age, it's increasingly... It's funny because uh, whenever we're shooting a particular car, there's always a similar car in the range, you know, that, that comes along. So in this day and age, it's increasingly hard to find cars that are basically as they came out from the factory. OEM wheels, um, stock ride height, stock seats, and it has low mileage. But in Japan, there are still quite a number of cars that have been kept by one or two owners of its entire life. It was never really driven hard. And the mentality of high spec sports cars here with Japanese owners is such that they are simply buying the highest spec of an iconic sports cars. The thinking of many owners is that they are buying a car that it's high spec within that range. It's quite common for Japanese to like to buy the most expensive spec of anything, whether it be cars or TVs, uh, or a camera, or a computer. And even back in the 90s, where people were flush with the bubble economy money, they had a lot of disposable income, to own especially a high-level sports car, and especially a GTR, driven by you know just uh, normal people who love these kind of cars for its heritage, and keeping them very, very stock. Some of them actually just maintaining it at the Nissan dealership its entire life. Lucky for us as car enthusiasts, we can find some of these cars in Japan. And this example uh, is, has had three owners. Tanner is the fourth one, actually. Let's talk a little bit about the history of the R33 GTR. So we have here the guidebook for when the car was new. There's all this information and right on the back, you can see their tagline, Super GTR. So why did they call this the Super GTR? The GTRs are based on the normal sedan and coupe uh, family model Skylines. It had everything from uh, economy 2 liter RB20 to a little more sporty RB25 with the turbo. But of course, as many of you know, the GTR range is very, very different from the regular Skyline turbos. In fact, it's a completely different car. But let's have a look why. So coming from the second generation Skyline GTR, 32 released in 1989 and finishing in 1994, its popularity in Group A racing uh, was phenomenal. And this really made 
the reputation of the Skyline GTR with the RB26, uh, even in Japan, before the rest of the world even knew about this car. Such uh, a hit, and it was a legend in its own right, that, of course, for the next generation model, a lot was expected. 32 came out in 1989. It had a twin-turbo race-derived inline six with 280 horsepower, a complicated part-time four-wheel drive system with four-wheel steering, and a reputation with a badge that harked back to the Hakoska. And coming into the next generation base model, which was introduced in 1993. So the GTR concept for the 33 was released and shown at the Tokyo Motor Show in mid-1993, as you can see from this photo here. And, and you can see that the front grille looked a little bit like the 32, where there wasn't a GTR badge and it had slat grills and the Skyline logo on the top of the bonnet. Then it took one and a half years before the full GTR road version was released. So the reason why engineers took their time to release the road version of the R33 was to give it more time to be developed on the Nürburgring in order to achieve a sub eight minute time. Now, anything below eight minutes in the 90s was pretty outstanding. And the R33 test version prototype achieved a time of seven minutes and 59 seconds. Now, this was actually 21 seconds faster than the R32 GTR. So let's have a look here. This is a reference diagram of the Nürburgring and an article here talks about the development improvements to make the R33 something that could rival the Porsche 911 and a Ferrari F355 and just any European contemporary cars. It was when Japanese manufacturers in the sports car range were very serious in, in, in challenging and proving that technology. It was a time when Japanese manufacturers were really serious about proving their technological might and ability in the 90s to be able to equal European contemporary sports cars. So Honda had theirs with the NSX uh, released in 1991. Toyota Supra released just a little bit before the R33 GTR followed suit and it was Nissan's turn to prove that they could use their engineering and racing experience from the 32's a large Group A wins and put it into the 33. So having said that, the 33 GTR actually has a lot of changes. It's fact, it's a very, very big development difference coming from the 32, taking all that data that they've learned. Uh, over 150 main points were different from the 32. So let's have a look at it in detail. So first, let's talk a little bit about the base model of the Skyline GTR. So the normal Skyline coming from the 32 into the 33 had much larger dimensions. It was longer by about 10 centimeters and wider by about five centimeters. In Japan, as we explained in the previous Lancer video, how they have two different categories for the length and width and engine capacity for classification. So a five number in Japan would mean that it's below 4,700 millimeters and of length and less than 1,700 millimeters in width with a two liter engine and not more than a certain horsepower category. This was so that the tax category and weight category would be at a more affordable level, whereas a larger car uh, with a label with a three number was larger and it was more of a luxury car class. So it's important to understand this dynamics because the base model was already larger in size in order to make it more comfort car oriented while still keeping some sportiness. The R33 GTR uh, became even bigger. In fact, the wheelbase was the main point in increase from the R32. So here is the original catalog of the R33 GTR and one of the pages inside shows the body in white, which is a bare body uh, without the body panels and the windscreen. Nice explanation of the body rigidity increasements and also attempts to lighten the body, giving it the uh, aluminum bonnet, which was already on the 32, and also the fenders. Structural increase over the base model, so you had a front strut bar as standard, you had a lower floor bar in the center, on the front and the rear, and this huge steel panel on the back uh, rear fire firewall, and a big difference in the strut 
Toa mountings. This time for the 33 model, it was brought higher for also for larger stroke, connecting the left and right um, strut towers underneath the rear windscreen. But engineers, engineers thought that wasn't enough, and the rear needed a lot more rigidity, and they created this huge plate with an additional uh, rear strut tower bar, and also on the underneath. All these really help to make the R33 GTR uh, really fast on the Nürburgring. It was heavily advertised at the time uh, in, in the media uh, and reviewed by uh, journalists as well. So let's have a look at also the other biggest change in the four-wheel drive system. Top view cross-section of the engine and drivetrain as you can see here, probably not possible to see on the real car, so it's good that we have a view from uh, a schematic view. You have the engine here placed as far back on the firewall as possible, RB26 engine. Uh, inline 6 is really long, but it's still within the wheel well housing. The 5 speed Nissan made gearbox is situated over here, and in this part is the transfer case. As you can see here, there's a front propeller shaft that this sort of style is quite often used on uh, off-road four-wheel drive vehicles but simplified for a road car. Uh, Nissan probably had uh, the te technology coming from the Safari and the Patrol but for the road car use uh, developed to turn rear-wheel drive cars into a, a four-wheel drive car. Now this system is part-time so there is a clutch activated system on the Atessa to uh, transfer torque via a shaft and the front differential goes under through the oil pan of the RB26. Um, right here. Here is the rear differential. You can see how it's very complicated. Rear double wishbone suspension uh, with multi-link on the rear. The front is a high mount type double wishbone suspension. These components are all different from the R32. So huge increase over there. Here's another photo of the uh, more advertise, uh, marketing material of the, <laughs> the Nürburgring time and all the efforts they made. So here is a schematic of the Nissan Artessa ETS Pro system, which is a little different with the V-Spec. So let's, let's have a look at the basic system. Being a longitudinally mounted four-wheel drive system, the propeller shaft most of the time sends drive to the rear. So the GTR is, starts off mainly in rear-wheel drive mode. It's mostly in rear-wheel drive mode and it only transfers torque to the front when it is needed, for example, at hard launches before it goes in a corner. And there are various sensors, uh, longitudinal and lateral G sensor feeding into a computer and all this uh, computer wizardry in, in enough to, to make a, a, a Microsoft computer look very complicated. But that's exactly what was so appealing about the Skyline GTR. The only other car that could match it in terms of raw um, like computing power with um, complicated differentials was the Lancer Evolution but in 1995 the, Lancer, the rival Lancer Evolution 3 still didn't have the AYC it was just fully mechanical it was only until 1996 when the Evolution 4 came over with AYC so the torque transfer mechanism is operating in two ways let's have a look you have the rear wheel drive mechanism over here of course so torque is mainly going to the to the rear wheels and when these host of sensors senses that the front tires uh, is slipping and needs more torque a hydraulic pump sends pressure to the center differential which then locks the clutch pack over here and transfers drive from the rear wheels. so like for example 100 percent up to 50 percent it's never really more than 50 percent via this transfer case to the front shaft and transferring drive to the temporarily to the front wheel so this is the biggest difference between the skyline gtr and other full-time four-wheel drive cars like the Lancer Evolution and the Impreza. And because of this, it could reduce understeer, which was one of the objectives in the R32. And with the R33, the increased stability of the longer wheelbase and wider track, the much stiffer body and a more advanced system of the four-wheel drive combined with fine-tuning to the RB26 engine, it was, that was how I was able to achieve 21 seconds faster on a tedious circuit like the Nürburgring. Now, when the car came out in Japan, and you can see from reference videos here uh, in Best Motoring, it was highly praised for its agility, even at that weight. The weight increase from the 32 was something like 70 kilograms, which is a lot. But uh, the refined 
turbochargers, electronics, uh, increasing from a, to a 16-bit computer and various other minor changes which we'll take a look later was something that really put the 33 GTR in 1995 at the top of the performance level. So this is a book from 1996 which shows a lot of data from tests done in on the Stuba circuit which was a benchmark for Japanese journalists to test the performance of sports cars. So let's have a look at what the R33 GTR achieved back in 1996 when the first the car first came out. One minute, three seconds, 0.58. Now, it's just at the first page, it's, it's number one. The next car, the next fastest car was the NSX Type R and one minute, five seconds. So hang on a second. That's an almost 1.5, almost two seconds improvement on a tight circuit that on like Scuba, which has a mixture of very low speed corners and medium speed corners and a very short straight, uh, really emphasizes on handling and punchiness and response of, of sports cars. And number three is the Toyota Supra RZ, which we previewed in the last video, coming in at one minute, six seconds, 0.17. So even that was slower than the lightweight NSX Type R. But the R33 GTR being 300 kilos or more heavier than the NSX with the four wheel drive system, twin turbo, chassis tuning could achieve this time. And I think somewhere there is data that when the R34 came out, it was about the same, if not, it was actually a little bit slower in stock form. And in the fourth place, we have the RX-7, FD3S RX-7 RZ, which was the lightweight version of the range, coming in at one minute, four seconds, 0.88. Faster than NSX. So that is actually faster than the Supra and the NSX, but still slower than the R33 GTR. The RX-7 was praised for its nimble and lightweight handling, but still the heavier R33 GTR somehow beat that. That's black magic computer wizardry, for sure. Just for reference, just for reference, the Evolution 3 came in at a pretty slow one minute, nine seconds. Four-wheel drive rally car, but uh, without the front LSD, it really, it really under, just understeered all over the place. Sorry, Evo fans. <laughs> the Integra Type R was faster, it was a one minute eight. FTO was one minute nine. What? What? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, what FTO? Yeah, faster than the Evil Evil Three. Barely, barely, barely. Like barely. giddy, giddy. Uh, just tell me a little bit about how you got into JDM and what was your impression of scanning ah. GDMs. Maybe like a lot of Americans, yeah. it was fast so and furious. Is that not not quite no, the fast and furious? Really. So like I did grow up uh, like most kids uh, playing the PlayStation One. So you have the Gran Turismo games. Uh, you know. Fast forward to like 2002, 2003 with the Xbox, it was like the need for speed. Everyone talks about the Skyline, everyone talks about the GTR. And so, you know, if I could tell myself back back then, hey, you're going to have a 33 GTR and live in Japan, I probably would never would have right, never right, believed right, it, right? right, 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 uh, right. But obviously, yeah, it, it is Godzilla. This image of what the Skyline was, was something that was unobtainable, something you, you can't have, you can't see, unless you're really looking into uh, maybe some old Top Gear footage or looking at old uh, hot version magazines or, or film. So let's have a look at the design of the R33 GTR. Now looking at this front mast, you might not really notice how different it is from the base model until we have a look at this reference photo. So this is the base Skyline GTS25 Turbo Type M. The base, the base model looks very much like the normal family sedan from that era with uh, slat grills and not much openings. And on the GTR, obviously with the twin turbo and high power, it needs more cooling, therefore bigger uh, grills, uh, widened space. Now, this car has the Nismo V-Spec optional uh, front bonnet, boilet winglet on the, on the top here. And it's missing the V-Spec's uh, huge cutout intakes you have also here the big grill and you can see the intercooler, a stock intercooler, which spans the length of this entire grill. And it's actually really large for a stock intercooler. Now on the 2.5 GT Turbo, it's one quarter the size, but with much thicker and it's usually located on this side. The air intake ducts here is for cooling, it goes into cooling the brakes. And 
uh, fog lights are, are also optional on this car and the early version models headlights uh, were not xenon so they are double on the later Koki models so let's have a look also at the front bumper openings this lower vent has actually a brake duct underneath right here which is designed to direct air, cooling air to the Brembo brakes uh, when the car is straight of course going on the side but on the v-spec there is an additional equipment guiding plate to direct air more accurately into behind the brakes for cooling so this is just some of the minor differences between the normal base model and the v-spec but a lot of people actually uh, bought v-spec parts and like for example the, the extra cooling duct from the bumper and all this to convert into a v-spec but it's not really difficult now the r33 came with two four five forty five r17 tires with 17 inch times 9 inch wheels made by bbs japan for uh, lightweight and these wheels are actually forged these days stock wheels even 33 and 34 they're worth quite a fortune brembo brakes you see here were carried over from the 32 v spec 2 more than sufficient for street use but on track use and for higher power applications um, even for the 34 these stock Brembo brakes have, have insufficient capacity, that's why a lot of people upgrade them to R35 brakes or, or whatever. But if you just want to keep the car stock, changing good pads and discs is more than enough. Most important thing is to just check whether the uh, master cylinder and the fluids are all refreshed. Uh, it's enough if you just want to run the car stock and as it is. The bonnet is made of aluminium. So this is the GTS4 four-wheel drive. So the GTR was actually based on this model because of the uh, same Atessa four-wheel drive, but the GTS4 had no turbo. So it was actually like a combination of this car and this car, but with a lot more. Now, one of the reasons why all this was carried over was that, the, not forgetting, the R32 GTR was a homologation car for Group A racing. So that large intercooler uh, to get uh, that 600 horsepower, uh, but detuned in the road car for, in actual fact, maybe about 300 310 uh, depending on how healthy the engine is also on the boost now the front wing or fender on the base model kind of looks like this and it's really hard to tell on the gtr we have to come right down to the side and you can see how the bulge is much more than the base model it's just kind of very gentle maybe we can see it if we go from a top view and you can see here how the door line comes up and it curves over the fender bulging out to give that wider track and coming smoothly down to the headlights side indicators are also different in design for the base model it's flush with the body panel and on the gtr uh, it's coming out like that just some really small details so you can see from the outside because sometimes some enthusiasts do convert the base models uh, into a GTR by having a wider the GTR fender uh, but sometimes the design of this is a little bit different as we've seen going to the back and you can also see how the bodywork is flared out to give a wider track and it's very very gentle on this car maybe less pronounced uh, on the 33 compared to the 32 here is a rear square on view of the base model and you can see how it's very streamlined with the rest of the body and on the gtr it has these nice power bulges uh, from the back and also the front giving that subtle uh, shape which makes it a bit more kind of muscular it kind of reminds me like a, a very built swimmer uh, it's definitely more elegant uh, than the 32 uh, the gtr and even compared to the 34 gtr uh, with its more angular and more squarish kind of sharp edge gundam like design the 33 is maybe maybe in our opinion very very elegant and let's have a look also at the rear design the tail lights were basically the same you had the iconic double circle brake and rear lights and the indicator and the rear reverse lights are the same here but this is where it's a little bit different uh, the skyline words uh, is in plain plastic and it's kind of like embossed whereas the base model was in chrome the bumper has some similarities of course it's missing the gtr badge which is very very important and the rear badge hides the 
key to open the trunk. Uh, very nifty. Let's have a look at the rear boot lid and trunk design of the R33. Now, even for the base model, it was a little quirky design point. The starting point of the, of the boot lid at the rear windscreen kind of starts off flush like that. But as we go towards the rear, the actual line of the boot lid, as you can see here, and if we close it, is actually lower than the rear three-quarter fender. Rear wing is a one-piece design which starts off flush with the rear three-quarter fenders and goes all the way tapering downwards. And if you look on the side here, you can see how the, the wicker angle uh, kind of goes up like this. And this design with aerodynamics uh, of the 90s, of course, tested in the wind tunnel, uh, was one of the points that created much more stability than the previous model. In fact, Nissan went through a lot of effort to design the shape of this rear wing. So let's have a look first. So here we have a diagram of uh, computer-assisted design of the front and rear fenders. And one of the key points of the smooth shape, of course, all cars are designed with the base model's shape in mind. And then for the high performance models like the GTR, design is added on afterwards as an improvement. So this is where we are looking at. And wind tunnel testing shows at the different angles. Oh, and by the way, this was also one of the first Japanese sports cars to have an adjustable rear attack angle, the wing. In fact, you can see it here. It actually has four attack angles for different levels of downforce and so it was adjustable so you can see here at zero it had a very impressive coefficient drag of 0 0.35 now 0 0.35 in the early 90s was quite remarkable the maximum amount of downforce it, it could create which is down here clf at the maximum attack angle of 18 degrees and it's plus from 0 0.14 this was one of the points that uh also surpass quite a lot of JDM cars uh, of that age. This combined with the front spoiler, also certain small different adjustments to uh, the suspension uh, and keeping it in a level uh, really helped it to achieve high speed stability and uh, traction on the Nürburgring. So let's have a look at some of the body and reinforcement improvements of the R33 GTR. Oh, but before that, uh, useful trunk space. It's, um, it's not too bad for a sedan-based car. Um, you could probably hold one golf bag and an, and an overnight shopping bag. An overnight travel bag, sorry. <laughs> Let's have a look closely here. And sticking out of the rear trim, you can see the rear strut bar and the word Skyline. But hiding behind this is the battery and also uh, the control boxes and the sensors for the Atessa ETS Pro. All this was done, if you look at this diagram here, to move more weight towards the center away from the rear. Now, the R32 GTR had the fuel tank located under the trunk, so for the 33, they moved it into the center underneath the rear seat, the super high cast system over here, the heavy rear battery and the controls and, and some fuse boxes right here. And in order to improve weight distribution and compared to the 32 uh, the improvement of weight distribution from the front to rear uh, went down by as much as 2.3 percent now behind this which you probably can't see is this is what it looks like it's a very small picture and you can see where the bracing in this form of a plate now in the 34 it's even larger but it's done away with, the, with that bar so it's moved inside and in here in this compartment, if you remove the lid, is the reservoir tank for the Atessa ETS hydraulic system, which shifts torque to the, between the front and the rear. But this is also the same pump that's connected for the uh, Pro system, which has the active differential. So uh, very similar to the Lancer Evolution, which also has the reservoir tank uh, in this position. So Tennis R33 GTR has the stock twin tailpipe muffler
Now, if you want to tell the difference between the regular version and the V-Spec version, if you're behind, this is one way you can have a look. So now we can see the rear differential. This is the um, high cast four wheel drive uh, mechanism, and you can see the KYB Nissan uh, actuator over here. But this is the rear diff on the V spec models, it has cooling fins for the active uh, torque splitting diff. So if it looks like this, this is just the regular version. This is the reinforcement bar, this is the reinforcement bar for the lower chassis, and uh, further in, it's the stabilizer bars and all these control links. All this suspension design was pretty high-tech for uh, the, the 90s. In fact, the 34 GTR is basically the same and it's huge improvement over the R32 with different geometry. So, first let's talk a little bit about your car. Okay. Um, it's got relatively low mileage. Mm -hmm. It's not even 60,000 kilometers. How much is that in miles? Uh, 37, 37, yeah, about 37,000 miles, if right. my math is correct. Someone can correct me in the comments, I'm sure. <laughs> but yeah, something around that, that uh, this mark. This is a 1995 or 96, 95 car. 95, so this is a March production 95 car. So it's one of the very early uh, productions of the Series 1. And that's 25 years old. Right. It's Which means 60,000 kilometers. That right. is low mileage, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, very low mileage. Wow. This car uh, was very well taken care of. And being, uh, like you had mentioned, it about 99% OEM, except for the Momo steering wheel. This, you know, you have the original uh, cassette player and everything, and shift knob and everything is That's in amazing. really good, yeah, like in really good condition. The OEM cassette player. So let's have a look at the engine of the 33 GTR. Lightweight aluminum bonnet. Not much effort to lift it up and it comes with a manual already inside. <laughs> so opening the bonnet of the Skyline GTR, we're confronted with a variety of acronyms. RB26 written on the cam head cover, twin turbo on the intake of the intercooler, Nissan, twin cam 24 valve, just in case we forgot that this engine is filled with all kinds of technology. Something very typical of the 1990s where you had stickers all over the car, four wheel drive, a Tessa, and you know, uh, it, whatever. This was one of the more charming points now when we look back at it. Cars these days had hardly any stickers on the outside to show uh, all these technical points because there was so much of them. If you were to have a modern car with all the technical points on the stickers, it would just fill up the entire door. So very much like the R34 and the R32 video that we did previously, the 33 uses the same inline six, 2.6 liter, six cylinder, twin cam, 24 valve twin ceramic turbos with uh, individual throttle body intercooled turbo with an oil cooler that's already a mouthful but where are the improvements from the r32 so let's have a look at them first of all now first of all the turbochargers were still ceramic but they had a slightly larger compressor and a more efficient flow and on the power graph here we can see so the R32 is in the dotted lines, the R33 in the solid lines, and you, this is the torque curve. It's improved by uh, 1.5 kilograms from 36 to 37.5, and with much better response, power climbs up and has better response around the mid-range, which is very important. Of course, this also offsets the increase in weight, which is almost like about 100 kilos on this car. Now, gear ratios were the same, but I think this tells very little of the story. The boost was increased on the twin turbos uh, from 0.7 to 0.89 on the R33 GTR. And here you can see how the uh, down pipes were also redesigned, increased from 54 millimeters to 60 millimeters. All these small minor increments, especially uh, the intercooler. Now, the intercooler looks the same from the outside but the capacity has been increased by 4%. What's interesting is that it's, even though it's bigger, it's lighter by 400 grams because the R33's larger body with the reinforcements made it 100 kilos heavier and the engineers needed to f go through all these different small parts and try to make it as light as possible. In fact, the suspension's lower arms are also made of aluminum. So a completely different design, which we'll look at it later. And here is where there's a also a difference from the R32, uh, newly designed uh, air intake, fresh air duct, which comes in from the front between the bonnet and goes 
into an air box and you can see the twin turbos on the side hiding underneath not sure if you can see it let's have a look over here now obviously that's a lot of equipment packed into a relatively narrow engine bay one of the difficult points of owning a skyline gtr unless you really knew what you were doing um, removing a lot of parts by yourself it's actually quite uh, difficult so for those of you who might want to buy this car in the future um, do make sure uh, you get as much material as possible uh, before you actually touch uh, a complicated car such as this the 33 gtr also comes standard with a strut bar compared to the 32 which was an option so all this equipment already from the factory uh, were very important in ensuring that that rigidity uh, was in the car right from the start and now if you look at the strut toa area this is where the 32 and the 33 is also very different the 34 looks almost the same because of the redesigned double wishbone upper mount suspension if you guys are looking for uh, any skylines uh, there's one weak point on some cars that uh, these bodies do tend to rust quite easily and of course this car is in very good condition now this is where you have the ceiling for the uh, upper mount panel and it's actually a sandwich panel and on some cars it rusts from the inside and if you encounter ever such a car just just forget it it's 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 trash it's going to cost too much money to repair so what you want to find is something that is minimum in this condition now let's have a look at the interior of the r33 gtr Ooh. for a car that's very big the interior uh, actually has not much more space than other 90s cars in the d segment i would say it's got a d segment kind of width now the windscreen is very close to you because of the very long bonnet the design is a real modern step up from the 32 you have all your controls here and the triple meters that only comes with the gtr we have boost here and at plus seven that's actually one bar so the stock gtr 33 goes to 1.8 you have the oil temperature and it's this meter that's the most interesting it's a front torque meter depending on how much drive is transferred by the center diff to the front this meter actually shows that change but an interesting thing is that because the center diff is a clutch pack system and depending on the sensors if the actual clutch pack wears out over time it doesn't actually physically transfer torque to the front but the meter actually still operates so that's one small point that um, if you guys buy a old Skyline GTR you might need to get this checked out most of the interior in Tanner's car is completely OEM factory except for this steering wheel he still has the original steering wheel uh, the earlier model had quite a unsightly bulgy looking uh, airbag steering wheel the Koki models had a better Momo four spoke design but other than that let's have a look at the details now the gear shift is a five speed and the FR style mounted gearbox throws out a little bit long but they go in very positively and uh, very mechanical nice meaty feel this is still the same design uh, from the R32 and the and one nice thing I like about the Skylines and some Nissans is the handbrake or side brake is located very near the shift so if you're on a hill um, just you know we have easy uh, very ergonomic um, hand positioning for the handbrake and the shift lever in fact you can just put your elbow down here and operate the shift lever and the and the, and the handbrake and here we have the meters on the gtr you have the 10,000 rpm and it revs up to 8,000 rpm being a short stroke engine it can rev up very high but maximum power on the stock model only comes in at 6,500 and over here is the oil pressure meter and you can see here at very low mileage not even 60,000 and I like how the water temperature gauge and the fuel gauge is sort of like cut into the speedometer um, and the carbon print on the surrounds uh, gives it a quite a sporty spartan touch now the panels here is one of the weak points of that generation of skylines uh, it's a kind of a rubber spray on overlay and over time it does crack and scratch up so um, this can't be helped but probably good refurbishers can actually solve this problem you have the original 
cassette player stereo system here and a very good item for people who are collectors and want to keep their car as stock as possible and um, let's see here let's turn on the car and start even from the 32 uh, the gtr models had a special key and on startup you can see the four wheel drive and the high cast lamps and this is important if it's the start of the car and it should disappear after two seconds Digital aircon, very typical of 90s, uh, showing high tech, thus high techness, and you can adjust here. Down here, uh, we have a little badge that says GTR, and typically it's a, it's a blank switch button. Side console has uh, ample space for putting your little bits and pieces of coins or boxes. Most of the interior is very typical 90s, it's drab and very plain, black plastic, but it kind of gives it that very simple Spartan look. Uh, but all over on the side trim here, the, uh, the cloth material is very high quality. Uh, some, of these, some of these plastic parts uh, squeak, but that, that can't be helped. Like this, this is something that could have been of a high quality product, but um, I think Nissan actually spent more money on the engine and the drivetrain than the interior. But also. 90s, mid 90s was when uh, car manufacturers really started to try and do a little bit cost cutting on plastic materials, and um, as evidenced by cars after the R34 on Nissan's, and not only Nissan's actually, a lot of other car makers, uh, it kind of went down. But on this generation, like for the dashboard, it's still soft touch materials, and it it holds up much better than the R32. Now the seat design. It's very similar to the R32. In fact, you might not think this design of bucket seat would hold you very well. The shoulder bolsters are seems very short. The material here is, is very nice, kind of like a semi-suede. But looking here, uh, it's a very deep bucket design and this padding here uh, is really comfortable for long drives. I'm gonna sit in it again just to show you how snug this is. Now for OEM seat, the, the front of the seat actually is raised um, quite enough to give you that in-seat feeling. The frame behind this is really hard and it does actually hold you in um, more than sufficiently. You might not need a Recaro on this. And the issue with uh, some of these Skylines is the headrest height is actually quite short. I'm 178 centimeters tall and I'm just about at a comfortable level so but um, of note is that now these cars are getting very expensive and OEM seats on the second hand market is also getting very expensive so um, I would advise not to change these seats out at all uh, it's part of the whole package of the car now for a two-door coupe this is a really convenient design feature it's a seat belt extender that pulls the seat belt forwards and makes it easier for the front the passenger to pull out the seat belt it even has a little swivel now this started on r32 and to the 33 and for the zenki series 1 r34 and then they discontinued that afterwards now for a stock bucket seat it's very interesting because the mechanism for adjusting the seat back is like a recaro you have the dial here and this one touch lift up brings the seat backwards and try not to get this stab your face all right get in and push the seat back the rear seats are also kind of a half bucket uh, obviously it's a two-seater at, at the back you're sat very low and at my height with the cushion like this and my head is kind of barely almost scraping the rear windscreen but this is one point on the 33 GTR because the wheelbase is longer than the 34. There's actually more than enough space in the rear seat on the 33 than the 32 or the 34. So I'm quite comfortable right here. Hi everyone, my name is Tanner. Uh, I go by Tanner Whale and this is my 33 GTR. Um, I've lived in Japan now for four years. 
but getting to this uh, moment in time took a while. I didn't initially start with 33 GTR, um, so I'm from America, so growing up stateside, I uh, originally had a Civic growing up, but even before that, you know, uh, I didn't really get into cars, or specifically, I didn't really get into JDM cars until I was maybe like 18, uh, 18, 19 years old, and a lot of that comes from uh, a buddy of mine, uh, shout out to Cody, he had an old S chassis, S13 hatch, it was RB swapped, and that was like my first introduction into uh, Nissans and JDM tuning cars and, and like drifting culture and, and all that jazz. So uh, it, was, it was an experience, and from there I kind of, I decided to work at a uh, Toyota dealership, transitioned into a Subaru dealership, had a couple Subarus, uh, had a supercharged uh, NB Roadster, and uh, then decided to move to Japan because I wanted to see the real car culture. You know, I wanted to see Japan. So that's why I'm here today. So um, shout out also to Noriyaro. Uh, Lexi was a huge influence on, you know, his old videos and whatnot of kind of influencing me to get into checking out car culture and whatnot. So with this 33 GTR, why a 33 over say a 32 or a 34? Part of that is cost. Um, 34s are a bit out of my budget, but um, the 33 seemed like it had all the tools to have a, a really solid driving experience. Um, it's a lot of people kind of want to hate on the 33s. They don't maybe get as, no, as much uh, recognition or respect as they deserve. But in terms of uh, times around the uh, Nürburgring and Tsukuba, there's in fact spec, uh, the 33 is a phenomenal car to drive. It's a pleasure to drive and, and being this car is essentially 99% OEM. Uh, I just had to have it when I saw it listed for sale. Tanner, thank you so much for lending us your R33 GTR. My pleasure. Very beautiful car. And um, we're going to have to open this. Okay. Gran Turismo Bible. And you know, like a lot of us JDM fans back then, we started with this, right? I'm sure you played this before. I, yeah, I was pretty young at the time when that came out, but uh, I definitely played it on the PlayStation 1. Uh, mm. Probably didn't respect it or uh, uh, enjoy it as much as I, I should have being at a younger age. They put uh, basically every Nissan ever made inside all of them inside. in Gran Turismo, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Years. R33. R33. And they even have the Zenki and the Koki ones. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Gran Turismo seems to put the real horsepower in brackets over here. And it says here 324 horsepower. Might be a bit optimistic, but maybe that's pretty close. Mm -hmm. The car does have maybe more than 218. All right, guys. And that was a review of Tana's very nice silver Zenki R33 GTR. And uh, let us know in the comments uh, what you think of this car and if you'd like us to do um, more different reviews. So that's all from us. Until the next time, peace out.